Thank you, and I'm going to turn it over to Anna. Great, thank you. Well, I was happy for a little bit of the chit chat because as soon as we were about to get started, I noticed the neighbors started doing their lawn. I thought this is not the right time for the lawnmower to go off, but I think they've stopped now. So, um, well, good afternoon. Um, on behalf of the Boston Fed, I want to welcome everyone uh, to this really important and timely conversation today. Um, and also especially a welcome to our incredible panelists this afternoon. Uh, my name is Anna Steiger and I am Vice President at the Boston Fed with responsibilities for overseeing our organization's community development work. Um, the Boston Fed has partnered with the YW on this event for a number of years uh, because we do share uh, a common public service mission and uh, that includes a commitment to promoting advancing racial equity. Um, this commitment for us is something that really got solidified and has deepened since we uh, released a report on the racial wealth gap in the Boston metro area back in 2015. Um, I do not need to say, um, to tell anyone here about the truly painful context that our conversation is happening in today. Um, a story, you know, a history of persistent inequities that have in our current pandemic uh, resulted in significantly different economic and health impacts, particularly for communities of color. For all of our organizations, we know that we see this in um, the lives of those around us and their families. And it's been, it's been really painful to experience and to watch. Um, as if this wasn't already enough to bear, um, there's more, uh, not just one or two, but three racially violent killings in recent weeks. Um, this is our context for today's conversation. It could not be clearer um, to any of us that we cannot have a viable recovery without addressing the persistent and systemic racism that exists uh, and looking at our broken systems that time and time again are leading to these outcomes. And I know that's the, the focus of our conversation today. Um, I'm aware that all of us on this call, and I know that folks are, are gathering even as I speak, um, all of us are thinking about how to bring the resources we have in our organizations, the influence, uh, whatever we have to bear to make change. Um, and so I wanted to just take a few moments to talk to you about what the Boston Fed is doing uh, and then to launch off uh, this afternoon's panel. Um, first of all, uh, we see a more urgent need than ever to talk about race and inequity at this time. Um, we're doing that you know, internally. Um, we're having more conversations at department levels, uh, with employee resource groups, uh, in bank-wide communications, and um, as well, we'll be having an organization-wide dialogue on race on Monday. Um, that's a start. There's a lot more for us to do here in this area, but it's, it's really important and couldn't be more urgent. Um, second, uh, we are an institution that has a lot of researchers. So researchers have been working really hard to think about what the most important questions are for policymakers at this time. So in, they have and are in the process of putting out um, briefs on um, two areas in particular. One, who has and doesn't have access to important critical benefits like unemployment insurance, paid sick leave, health insurance. And then also uh, a set of initiatives or briefs on you know, who's most impacted and what areas and how are areas impacted by the crisis. Uh, things like food security, home ownership, rentals, uh, renters, and different occupations, particularly how are service workers being affected by COVID. Um, where the data supports this, we are calling out the disparate impacts by race and, uh, and making calls for action. A third, the Boston Fed is part of the Fed system, obviously, and um, as part of that has responsibilities for standing up the system's Main Street lending facility, um, providing loans to medium and small businesses. And um, so that's happening, that's in progress, and there's a system-wide group for the Fed system looking at how to extend um, that opportunity, those resources, to a wider group of organizations while still working within the parameters set for us by Congress and the US Treasury. And finally, I wanna mention uh, some ways that we're doing some real on the ground work uh, around economic, specifically around equitable recovery, which I know is our, uh, their main topic today. Uh, one, we have our Working Cities Challenge, which is a grant competition to support cross-sector teams in five states. 
um, and their focus has been on promoting um, the strength of lower income residents. And we're supporting them in pivoting their work uh, so that they can lead and participate in equitable recovery efforts in their communities. And then also we uh, hope and expect to launch soon a new initiative with the Metropolitan Area Planning Council and the Government Alliance on Race and Equity to create learning and action cohorts of Boston metro area municipalities to support them as they think about racial equity recovery plans. And we expect that areas of interest for these cohorts, cohort, excuse me, cohorts would be business support, employment and or criminal justice reform. So we really are thinking about um, what economic recovery um, will necessitate what it could look like, and in particular, laying out the role of race and the persistent previous inequities and how those have been highlighted by COVID. Um, so we know that that's what we're talking about today. So that's why we're particularly um, you know, pleased to be able to partner with YW on this event tonight. Um, it's a really dark time for us. Um, at the same time, there is this bright spot here where we have this incredible set of women leaders here with us today to talk about uh, their vision for equitable recovery. And, um, and we're, we're all, all ears to listen, to hear, and to see where we can support this vision. So thank you for joining us tonight and, um, and looking forward to the panel. Thank you. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. And thank you, Anna, for kicking off the afternoon with your powerful remarks. Also, thank you to the rest of our friends at the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston for partnering with YW Boston for the third consecutive year to make this event happen. I'm excited to have over 500 people joining us today. I'm Beth Chandler, President and CEO of YW Boston. For over 150 years, YW Boston has been committed to eliminating racism and empowering women in Boston and beyond. We fulfill this mission through our programmatic work and events like this afternoon's. Since the advent of physical distancing, we have increased the number of online events that we host, in part to shine a light on the glaring disparities laid bare by COVID-19, and also to help people construct the actions, both big and small, to eradicate future disparities. As we move towards a future post-COVID-19, it's important to re-envision that future with an inclusive and equitable lens. As recent tragic events have shown, as a nation, we continue to face another crisis in addition to COVID-19, racism, and more specifically, anti-Blackness. YW Boston wishes to extend our deepest condolences to the family of George Floyd and to our Black community across the United States. We must prioritize racial justice and anti-racism in every facet of our lives, from the individual to the collective, our collective goal should be to address racism within our policies, practices, behavior, systems, and institutions so that we can move closer towards racial equity. For that reason, our work towards racial justice is as important as ever. We intend to host more important conversations like today's discussion with this trailblazing group of women city councilors, and we need your help to do it. Like other organizations, YW Boston faces unprecedented financial challenges due to the pandemic. If you, if you can, please go to our website and make a donation. Whether it's $2, $20, or $200, every amount helps. Thank you in advance for your generosity. Your gift will support our commitment to a better, more inclusive Boston. And now a few housekeeping rules before we start. Everyone who registered for the event will receive a follow-up email with a recording of the session. And to help with the facilitation of today's discussion, please submit all questions via the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. And the councilwomen will do their best to answer all the questions and we'll start questions around 5.05. I also wanna note that questions that are specifically for Councilor Mejia, if you could note that in your Q&A, Councilor Mejia has to leave right at five, so before the Q&A starts, but we will send any questions uh, specifically for her to her and her staff, and then she will respond via Twitter. And lastly, I'd love to give a huge shout out to the councilwomen, their staffers, and the fund development team at YW, for this event would not be possible with all of their hard work. 
Now, please join me in welcoming city councilors, Kenzie Bach, Liz Braden, Andrea Campbell, Lydia Edwards, Anissa Asabi George, President of the Council, Kim Janey, Julia Mejia, and Michelle Wu. And before I start with questions, I do want to give uh, Council President Janey an opportunity to speak about the recent events. Thank you so much. Can you hear me? Yes. Wonderful. Uh, before I do that, I, I want to thank you, Beth. I want to thank you for being an important partner in this work. I want to thank you for hosting uh, what I think is going to be a really important conversation. This is our third time doing this, and I think it has served um, as an important uh, springboard for other women to, to find a place for them uh, in this movement. So I think uh, these conversations are important, particularly now. Um, I also want to uh, thank uh, Dominique and, and Anna from the Fed. Um, certainly want to thank all who are listening or watching and my deepest gratitude uh, to my sisters in service uh, who are on the Zoom call with me um, and who do this work with me every single day. I am really grateful for their, their partnership and for their leadership. Um, as you mentioned, we are at a really difficult point in our nation's history. And we have an opportunity before us. We're at a crossroads here. And we have a decision to make about how we respond. In Boston, I am hoping that we will respond and be on the side of justice. And I think we can achieve that through the work on the Boston City Council. At today's council meeting, we opened up the meeting, like many, uh, with a moment of silence for eight minutes and 46 seconds. I wanted us to sit with that discomfort. I wanted us to take a moment to reflect on George Floyd's life and what it was like in those last eight minutes and 46 seconds as he cried for breath, as he cried out for his mother, and we know that this story is all too familiar. Many people say, this is new, this is different. For many of us, this has been going on for far too long, 400 years in one form or another in terms of violence against Black people. And so we have an opportunity to change the course of American history to say no more, we will no longer tolerate any American citizen, any resident of this nation, regardless of citizen, citizenship status. We should all feel safe. We should all be welcomed. This is our home. We've all made incredible contributions. And we have a system in place, white supremacy, that elevates a few at the expense of all others. And it's time that we tear that down. I've said it yesterday at our press conference. There was a press conference at the State House where electeds of color all over our Commonwealth joined to demand justice. And we know we cannot achieve that justice without some real action. And so we had uh, we have a 10-point plan, and we hit the federal level, the state level, the city level, and we need for everyone to be a part of this. This is going to take a lot of work, hard work. We need everyone on board. We need to have the political will and the courage to do what is right. And so it is particularly important that people who are watching who do not look like me, that they take a moment to reflect on their own privileged position and power and how that either contributes to the death of someone like George Floyd or what they will do with that privileged position and power to prevent that from happening again. That is the question that is before us. And I'm really grateful that I get to do this work 
with YW and that I get to do this work with my sisters in service on the Boston City Council. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Council President Janey. And I'd love to hear from some of the other counselors really on the same issue. And let me just provide a, a little different frame. I received an email uh, earlier this week from a black mom who had to have a conversation with her two kids, a son who's nine and a daughter who's seven. And for those that don't know what the conversation is, it's a riff on the same theme, which is as black people, we are not treated the same in this country. We are not looked upon as the same. And if you're not careful, that could lead to your death. And her nine-year-old son, when she was putting him to bed, tears welled up in his eyes. And he looked at her and he said, mommy, I don't wanna be black because I don't wanna die. So given that, what do you think it will take here in Boston to stop those conversations so parents, particularly black parents, don't have to have those conversations anymore with their kids and that it, you don't feel that it's a liability being, you know, living while black? Councilor Campbell? Um, Beth, I wasn't sure if this was a question directed at all of us and we should- It is. Hand. Okay, okay. Um, so, First of all, thank you guys for hosting and thank you for uh, posing the question. Um, I was just actually holding my five month old and I told my husband to take him because I, this is uh, important. And I wanted to have all my emotions intact before answering uh, or responding. Um, first of all, it has been extremely hard and difficult during these times. I think Council President Janey summed up um, some of the, the trauma and the pain that we are feeling um, and the action we're all willing to take. But as a mother, and obviously there are other members of the council who are also mothers, Councilor Wu was talking about being a mother earlier, just earlier today, uh, Councilor Mejia, Councilor Asabi George. Um, but in particular, when I look at my two boys, I have two black sons, I have a two-year-old and I have a five-month-old. Um, I share that pain of that mother. And one of the things we were talking about today is how do we uh, make sure, ensure that this doesn't happen again? And what is the this? That innocent black men and women don't continue to die in the streets in the face of police brutality, that we value their life and what does that look like? And for me, the, the answers are quite simple, that we can of course work to enclose every inequity with respect to every system, the criminal justice system, the banking system, the school system, health disparities, all of that. But if we are not willing to talk about race and racism in this country, none of it matters. And so I love coming into these spaces to have that conversation. Um, I have been found, finding it very difficult to have some conversations with some folks um, who don't look like me, who are white, who are supposed to be allies and accomplices in this work, who are not willing to put up the mirror and say, what biases do I hold in my heart? How am I going to work to be an anti-racist? How am I going to work to transform systems? What does white privilege mean? What does systemic racism mean? If folks don't have a working definition of those terms, uh, understanding and a deep understanding of those terms, we are bound to continue to perpetuate inequities in all of the systems in which we operate. And more importantly, and sadly, I often think about my young boys. And you know, for many young children, like the mother you just shared, you know, George Floyd is a critical moment for that child where that young person is thinking about you know, am I angry towards white people? Am I angry towards the other? There's a lot of emotions there. And I'm thinking, who are, who's going to be that for my boys? You know, Trayvon Martin, when that happened, we said we were going to end this. And how many deaths later are we still talking about the same thing? I remember my younger brother when talking about Trayvon Martin. He was angry. He was angry. He was angry. And he said, you know, I hate white people. I'm like, no, you don't. So who is going to be the Trayvon Martin for my boys? So at some point, we have to roll up our sleeves and have the tough conversations. And white people have to be willing to do that. And I've been naming that explicitly. I think we cannot beat around the bush. That is the hard work. That is the necessary work. Um, and I look forward to doing it in partnership with all of you guys. 
Um, I will tell you throughout this presentation, I'm going to be extremely emotional because it is an emotional time for all of us. And I cannot pretend um, or sort of suppress any emotions that I've been feeling. Um, I was hesitant to almost participate in the panel because of the emotion I'm feeling. But I thought it was an opportunity to share mainly with those folks who do not look like me that this is an opportunity for you to do something differently. Thank you, Beth. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. And Councillor Mejia. Yes. Um, thank you for hosting, and I'm happy to be here, even despite these circumstances. Um, so I identify as an Afro-Latina. Um, I claim my Black roots. Um, that's not something that you hear a lot of Latinos doing. Um, but when they do, we need to celebrate that, because there is this Blackness. Um, sentiment no matter where you happen to live in the globe um, and that is so deeply rooted and seated um, and I think our children are the ones that learn from us and when I when I hear the story about this mom I think about my own daughter who's half black and half Dominican and she claims her black roots and when she goes to her school and tells her friends that they're black too, and they push back. And then their moms call me and say, what are you teaching your daughter? Telling her that she's black. And now she's telling my kids, you know, that they're black. And this, we teach our kids this at home. When we don't um, speak up. And for my daughter to already start noticing the differences, right? Of how we're treated as opposed to how others are treated and coming home with messages from other parents telling her that, you know, who is she to identify someone else as something other than how they've been led to believe they are. Um, doesn't sit well for me because as a parent, I have a responsibility to help my child understand what loving all of who you are looks like. And when when she's afraid that her father is going to be murdered, um, when when she's worried about her her cousins um, leaving the home, or even when I am afraid to look at a cop if I'm driving, because I might think that I, if I look at him, he might think that I've done something wrong. All of that trauma is all of what we're carrying mm -hmm. everywhere we go. And it has manifested and continues to brew, and yet, all we keep doing is having the same conversation, just dressed up differently and not much changes. And I think that that is why we have reached our boiling point where it's not even about enough is enough. Enough is enough was a long time ago, you know? And what do we tell a mom what do we tell a mom? People will leave the house. Your son should be afraid to leave the house because we won't know if he will come back. That is not what we want to tell a mom. But this is what moms have to tell their children every single day is to watch yourself. Instead, what we should be doing is telling the system, right? Watch yourself, reform yourself. Why do we always have to carry the brunt of the work? We have to get to the point when this accountability and transparency is not just a buzzword. It's about action and that we have the political will to do it. And yeah, I'm just as emotional. And for those who know me know that I can be a little bit um, feisty. So. I'm going to reserve the rest of my time to allow my other colleagues who are, who I know have a lot 
from their yeah. hearts. Yeah. Beth, can I, can I just jump in? Oh, Sure, I'm gonna go Councilor Wu and then and back to you, President Cheney. I'll, I'll defer to, to my president if, if it's relevant to um, this exact time, like it, some It is, to this very said. topic. Yeah, go for it. Thank you, uh, Councilor Wu. Um, I too, so yesterday I shared the heartbreak um, of just thinking of my grandsons. I don't know one single black man in my life who has not had a negative interaction with the police. My godson had one just last week, got pulled over, didn't get too negative. He got pulled over for no apparent reason, Ex you know, mentioned that his, that his father was a police officer and then it was all good. I think that was with the Stadies. Um, I, I think about my two grandsons being the only two black males in my life and, and children their age uh, who may not, and many children their age have already had a negative <laughs> experience. My grandchildren currently are 12 and 16. Many other 12 and 16 year olds, particularly in the neighborhood that I represent, have already had negative experience, experiences with the police. And I am just, I feel like there, there are, like I'm looking at an hourglass and the sand is just slipping away because it's just a matter of time before they have to experience that for themselves. There was a story five years ago, my grandson, he was eight at the time and they were into this show called The Flash. And he said to me, he was watching it with me over here. He said, men get killed in this world. It's the opposite of our world. And I didn't know what he meant by that. Um, I thought I knew, but I wanted to be sure. So I asked him, what do you mean? And what he said was, in our world, a lot of black men get killed. So on this show, the men who were getting killed were white men. And at eight years old, he is telling me that the world he is watching on television is the opposite world of our world because in our world, black men, in our world, a lot of black men get killed. That is out of the mouth of an eight-year-old. My grandson, who is now 12, he will be 13 a week from today. My, one of my, my best friend, her son is 17, soon to be 18. She, of course, is having the talk repeatedly. His question to her, why do I have to change? Why can't I be who I am? Back to Council Mejia's point. This system devalues Black lives and we are forced to change and adapt to this system. And if we don't, we are crushed. That is not just, that is not fair, that's not equitable. Thank you, Councilor Wu. I just wanted to make that point. I needed the moment to collect myself anyway. Uh, so I, I wanted to um, also thank uh, Beth and YW and, and the whole team and all the staff involved in, in making sure we got to continue the tradition of, of being together with you all. Um, I will admit that I'm a little more than a little happy it's not at 7 a.m. or 7.30 or whenever we usually do it. Um, on this topic of the disease that has been plaguing our country since the very founding, since the, the first definitions of what it meant to be an American, um, you know, we, we just had our council meeting earlier today and uh, I just about lost it earlier talking about what it meant as a mom of two boys to think about um, standing in solidarity and, and, and what that means and, and the importance for um, every community and, and for myself as an Asian American to be standing in solidarity and, and um, emphasizing that we all have the responsibility to 
act um, to use whatever influence and, and power and, and access and privilege that we have as individuals um, to change the system, to lift up that Black Lives Matter, um, but that I, you know, I echo what my colleagues have said already, that it's, it's most important for those of us who have the power and privilege of being in elected office to recognize that that is on us, right? We are part of a failure of government over a long, long time, certainly, but on our watch too, that there are specific actions that we could take tomorrow, right? Not just at the federal level, not just at the state level, but at the city level. And let us remember um, that it's in our hands, right? So that, that this anger and hurt and, and all of the um, momentum and, and just indignation that we're feeling right now needs to be channeled into votes, into legislation, into action, into budgets. Um, I had named a couple items before that have been on, on my mind and so many of my colleagues and um, community advocates have been lifting up, particularly around um, police brutality and ensuring that Boston police um, are accountable. But this is not about the record of any particular police department, but, the, but recognizing that every police force stems from a uh, from systemic racism and a structure um, that needs to be accountable. So we need to um, have a civilian review board to hold Boston police accountable. We need to end the gang database that profiles black and brown youth. We need to um, pass legislation that's already been filed that would restrict uh, surveillance in certain ways and, and uh, ban face surveillance altogether. Um, and then, you know, outside of the realm of ending police brutality, there's much more to do when it comes to ending systemic oppression. And again, there is a lot that is on our plates as city councilors and um, at the city level that would make a difference immediately for Black families and for uh, families who are our constituents and in our communities. We think about procurement reform and expanding economic opportunity, um, fair housing, educate, you know, ensuring equity in our education system, uh, pushing for fair free transit. All of this, you know, clean air, clean water, climate, I mean, all of this comes around to the, the recognition that there are many violences that have uh, been inf inflicted upon communities of color and, and in particular Black families, and those many of them are um, long-standing, uh, slower crises compared to coronavirus. But we have to see that people are out in the streets protesting and rallying because even more important than their own individual safety, right, than protecting themselves from the virus, they need to protect all the young black boys in our lives, right? We need to end this once and for all and make sure that um, we're seizing on this moment to, to do something. Right. And I want to thank all the counselors that have spoken so far. I know that for many of you, this, this is personal um, and you are speaking from the heart and I think everybody listening and, watch, and watching appreciates the authenticity that you are bringing to this conversation. Um, I wanted to switch the question a little bit and if people want to come back because they haven't ha had an opportunity to speak, please, please do that. But I also want to ask some other questions and get some other voices involved. And so for the, the newer counselors, um, Councillor Bach, Councillor Braden, and, and Councillor Mejia. Um, you came in with ideas and, and areas and issues that you wanted to, to push and, and put forward. Um, you, how are the, what are those? Are those still the same issues? Do you have new issues that um, you want to make sure you're advocating for? Would love to hear the, the three of you speak a little bit about what are your priorities and, and if they've changed given all that has changed during your, your tenure so far. 
I'll go with Councillor Bach first. Sure. Thank you so much, Bess, and thank thank you to you and um, and YW, and uh, also to the Fed and everyone for having this conversation with us today. Um, you know, I think I I came um, out of work on affordable housing, um, and that was really the um, issue that drove me to run for the city council. And um, there's nothing quite like a pandemic to suddenly like really force the point that it's not acceptable for people to not have housing. Um, and I think we saw that really strongly in the, uh, in the opening weeks of this. And it's a, it's a problem that persists. We still have lots of families um, in shelter at, who are not stably housed and not safely housed given the conditions of this pandemic. Um, and one of the things that I've been thinking a lot about that I think I hope when I think about what it means for us to rebuild more equitably as a society, I think about the fact that um, there are a lot of social systems we have, whether it's for housing, um, you know, a good education for our kids, whether it's, um, you know, access to food, where when people don't get those things, we talk about them slipping through the cracks. Um, and I think of kind of like, you know, the picture, I mean, right, it's like, we talk about a social safety net, but I think about it more like a bowl, you know, that we're sort of cupping, that's what our society is meant to be. It's meant to be a, a bowl that sort of holds folks. And we talk about it like, oh, people are slipping through the cracks. But I think that what you see really become plain is like, we, we haven't built a bowl, we've built a sieve. Like the holes are there, they're intentional. Like we, we there, you know, are forces at work that think, hey, it's gotta be possible for people to be homeless because people need to pay rent at a certain level, right? There's just, there's like, you know, food systems. Well, we can't, in a pandemic, we can provide everybody with the food they need, but when it's not a pandemic, you know, we can't really sustain it. I just think, I think there's a way that the, the pandemic is showing us the systems we have that we've built to have b sibs instead of bowls. And that's, that to me is really the, the place you have to start. Um, when it comes to changing things. And, and so I guess for me, that's uh, something I feel really strongly about on the housing front and that has not changed, um, but it certainly has intensified. Thank you. Councillor Braden. Thank you. Thank you so much for hosting this conversation. Um, like like Councillor Bach, uh, one of the driving issues that brought me to run for office was the whole issue around housing and um and and also how the bpda oversees uh, planning in the city um we've seen it here in my district to how 15 years ago we we seem to have a, a much more diverse community of uh, brazilians and central americans and 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 then just all of all, those those communities seem to have gone and I think it was a silent creeping gentrification of our neighborhood and, and lower income families, uh, 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 immigrant families have been displaced by the housing market here. And it's been such an uphill struggle to really um, enforce uh, the, the vision of having uh, building housing for all. And, uh, you know, I think, it's still, you know, we have we have policy in the works. We're proposing um, um, under the leadership of uh, Councillor Edwards. We're we're proposing uh, to push forward with uh, fair housing. Uh, should be in would be one of the metrics that we use when we do planning in the city. And uh, I really feel that that's something that is long overdue. Um, housing for uh, fair housing. Uh, housing for all means you you house low income families, you house multi generational families, you house people with disabilities, you house your elders, um, and just really you look at the whole um, uh, the whole structure of our community and and recognize that everyone has value and everyone has a place and everyone deserves to be uh, stably housed. Um, and that's one of the big issues for me. Um, 
this is an incredibly difficult and emotional uh, time, but I think it's like we've we've we're pulling the it's like a sword with a scab on it, and we're we're tearing the scab off right now, and we're looking at just how how the underlying wound of systemic racism, and um, we we have to set about healing that wound and making things right. And it's not going to be easy. It's going to be a, not a not a sprint. It's going to be a marathon. It'll take a lot of a lot of also like me as a white that I have to listen deeply to my sisters in service and 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 folks in the black community and understand. I I I cannot due to my I'm 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 I I'm white I I I can't understand the experience of my black sisters but I I just have to stand in solidarity and and be as best an ally as I can possibly be. Thank you. Thank you. And Councillor Mejia. Yeah. Um. So you know to be completely honest. Um. I was running uh, and I'm a community organizer and an activist. So I was still, you know, trying to get into a space that I never really um, had operated in. Most of my art interactions was always trying to tear it down and, 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 and scream about all the things that were wrong. And so walking into this space, you know, I was really um, during the campaign was really talking about amplifying the voices of the people who um, have lived experience and really breaking down barriers to engagement. So a lot of the, um, the efforts that I saw myself doing in this role was really about the civic engagement piece of it, right? Making sure that, you know, like I always say, nothing about us without us is for us. And because we're usually not at the table, we're always on the menu and we're being eaten up alive every single day that I wanted to change the way we do business. But I didn't think um, that COVID-19 was going to expedite that process even further um, in terms of just access because then we moved into Zoom land um, and that created more opportunity for people to be more plugged in and to pay attention to the public hearings and started really creating a different type of dialogue and, and engagement. But um, in terms of issues, what I've learned as a result of COVID was really issues around food insecurity, issues about language access. Um, you know, when, when uh, information would come out, it usually would come out first in English only, and then it was translated into different languages. I, I didn't really have that understanding of engagement um, to this depth until this happened. Um, and so a lot of the work that I've done since being um, in office and since uh, COVID was really about addressing uh, language access and food insecurity. But more importantly, when I think about language access, it's not just about translation and interpretation. That is easy. It's really about the level of cultural competency um, and in, in, the, in the way the information is coming out. People were talking about flattening the curve and uh, social distancing. Around my way, we don't talk like that. So I'm like, what do you flatten what curve? Um, so really helping the city uh, and agencies and folks who were trying to engage communities to be able to speak in ways that we would understand it. So language access is, is just beyond the, the stereotypical things that you see. I'm looking at cultural competency. I'm looking at also making sure that we recognize that not everybody knows how to read and write in their own native language, let alone in English, right? So how do we, how do we communicate with people in ways that they're gonna be able to understand what's at stake? You know, and also looking at the digital divide um, there are a lot of folks right now when, when we had to transfer over to the Zoom world um, that they didn't even know what Zoom was or how to help their children get onto remote learning. There's a lot of things that we, um, especially folks who, who worked in offices before, just took for granted that, that families would know how to how to open up an app, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's they, just really... I think that what I have learned in this space is not just about policy, it's about how do we remove barriers for people and how do we help connect people to the resources that the city has to offer in a way that they can benefit from that. And so um, I've been looking at my work through programming policy 
um, protocols and procedures, you know, and people. I've, I really have centered a lot of the work um, post COVID around this different framework that looks at the work through a number of different lenses because everyone needs something different. And so I didn't run on that campaign. I, I, I didn't run on that vision because I didn't know it. And I'm an exponential learner and every day I'm learning something new. Like the budget season, I learned so much about all the different departments that exist even within the city of Boston. I feel like the last, I've been in office for over a little bit of a, a, hundred, a hundred days um, and I have had baptism by fire. I have learned how to do all of these things by just diving into it with the support of my colleagues and my sisters who are in this call right now who have pulled me to the side and I said, well, this is how you say it. You know, Madam Council President, this one and the gavel and that, like all of these things I have learned during these tough times with the support of my sisters, right? And I think that it's the sisterhood that has helped me navigate these difficult times. And so, yeah. I wanna uh, get Councillor Sabi George and Councillor Edwards into the conversation. And I would love to hear your thoughts on what are some of the successes that you feel the city has had, if any, during this time. and what are you really hopeful to see happening to, to set the city up for success post COVID-19? And Councillor Sabi George and Councillor Edwards, I'd, I'd love for the two of you to, to answer that question. Thank you, Beth. And I, I do think, you know, we've gone, we've spent a lot of time planning to get to this day and to have this conversation. And this conversation was supposed to be around the challenges with this pandemic and COVID-19 but how fascinating it is that the challenges of dealing with the pandemic and our response as a city and the work that we need to do as a city, a state, and a nation is interchangeable with the conversation around the incidents of police brutality, around the conversation of institutional racism, and how um, those two conversations in so many ways have exposed sort of the, the real experiences that residents have, have had for their lifetimes. And for us, I think in a, in a backwards way, the successes that we have seen during the pandemic piece has been the exposures of the vulnerabilities across our system. Uh, Julia was talking a little bit about our schools and the, the lack of access to technology that our kids have had in their own homes, the lack of resources they have had at their disposal in order to do the work that they need. How um, ill-prepared our school system was to go virtual, to go online. And then the discrepancies between, um, you know, you think about the, the different school districts, if we just looked at the state or the country, but then we break it down by school and then we break it down by classroom and then we break it down by student. We have exposed some tremendous vulnerabilities that we need to fix and fix quickly and we've made tremendous gains and we've been tremendously um uh well i tremendous probably not the right word but we have we've made gains in an incredibly quick time but still so many of our kids lag behind and that's that's the flaws that have been exposed when we think about the schools when we think about access to food we think about the housing piece we think about the number of uh, individuals who are experiencing homelessness and dealing with substance use disorders and dealing with mental health, which continues today, how they've had this uh, extremely high level of exposure to COVID and what that means within that community. So I'd say the exposures, our um, ability to respond to some of it uh, in a good way, but then our uh, inability and failure to respond to so many other pieces have been exposed and have created for our city a roadmap for the work that's left undone. Um, I think it's because of the the police brutality and the other and the context that we're dealing with today. It's it's hard right now to count the successes um, that the city has under its belt. Um, I would say I, the successes that I would count would be looking around at the coalition building in the community and the coming together for peaceful protests into the thousands 
and in multiracial uh, peaceful protests. It's the successes have been folks who I would consider pretty conservative saying, ah, this is not right. Something is not right. And I need to figure this out, reaching out to me and other folks. Um, I think it, for the city right now, uh, we don't necessarily have successes when it's dealing with um, race or uh, when, it de when, when dealing with COVID and we're dealing with anything like that uh, at this particular moment. It's because it's hard to assess a success in the middle of the storm, right? We, 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 we barely have time to reflect on it. So I'm not saying we're not doing things right. I'm saying success is not the correct word right now. Um, we will know when we can pause and look back and see. But I will say, um, if at anything, and this is you know, somewhat echoing what Councillor Sabi George just said, uh, COVID is the opportunity to reset. And that's actually what Councillor Box said in a recent hearing. That's, that's, that's what we have right now, is one of the greatest opportunities in generations to reset and, and to use this as the reason to reset. And to say we cannot continue the way we were at all. And we are slowed down in a way that we've never been before. Less traffic, less kids in school, less people going to work, all of these things have forced us to sit down. So the question for us as a city is how we're going to stand up and how we're going to reflect on these moments. I do not think it's a success. I think it's an emergency response um, by giving out money and grants to people in housing. Mm -hmm. An eviction moratorium is a band-aid. That, that rent will be due. And we're never going to be able to get out enough, give out enough money to uh, prevent the wave eviction that's going to happen. You know, there's a, in the book Evicted, it says black men get locked in, where black men get locked in and locked up, black women get locked out. Eviction, this crisis is going to only be another enhanced uh, pouring of gasoline on the already uh, issue that we have with the pandemic of racism. So I, I pull back and I think literally uh, if, if by December 31st, 2020, we have not passed certain ordinances, and I'm including my um, equitable housing ordinance, where we have to assess planning of the city of Boston and how we see the city of Boston through a racial equity lens, through a class equity lens, assessing where our families are gonna go going forward. If we do not have a check mark for how we're going to see and, how, and telling developers how to come correctly to the city of Boston, if we don't have that, if we do not have the, the conversation and at least the rubric for setting up a citizen review board for our police, if we do not have, um, uh, if we have not banned facial recognition, if we have not completely and totally separated police from our public schools, if we haven't done those things, there's no success. There's no point in being proud of ourselves getting through the COVID. It's we should all be embarrassed. Progressives have a majority on the city of Boston City Council. We have the votes. I, I can't speak to the mayor and what he's going to do, but we do have enough votes plus a couple other folks to bring in to override his vote and his thought. And I, I'm telling people, I'm talking to my colleagues directly. This is, this is the call of our generation. And it's the moment that we, will, we cannot pass. There's a baton being passed on to us. And the question is what we're going to do with it. And so that is when I could, we will assess successes. December 31st, 2020, what did we get done? Thank you. Councillor uh, President Janey and Councillor Campbell, Councillor Wu, as veterans of the Boston City Council, um, Councillor Edwards just said that this is a time to reset, that this is an opportunity, a moment that we as a city can reset. As veterans, are you optimistic about being able to reset? Mayor, please uh, correct well, the change. Yeah, so I'm sorry. We and Kim are, are, are sophomores. <laughs> and I hardly think of myself as a veteran. <laughs> we came at the same time. time. Into my second term. I'm Fair not enough. a newbie anymore, <laughs> <laughs> like Kenzie and Liz. But, um, I, you know, I would say this. Again, the opportunity 
is before us. As uh, Lydia has already set the stage, and the question is, what are we going to do? What I want to address here, you know, as we're talking about COVID, we're talking about all these other things, and we keep saying, you know, COVID exposed. But the real issue is we knew. We had been saying all along. COVID exposed what? We had been telling you. The problem is you got to listen to Black people. Listen to Black women. Trust Black women. We had been saying this. So that's one problem. I think the other thing um, is we've got to get beyond just thinking about this in terms of resources. Absolutely, we need resources. I need resources in District 7. Let's be real clear. But the problem is the systemic inequities. The answer, so why, you know, why are we saying, uh, how do, can we give out more Section 8 vouchers? Nothing against Section 8. My very first apartment was a Section 8 apartment. I would not have had it without that voucher. But the real question is, why aren't more people able to own a home? Okay. Like, why do people need the vouchers in the first place? That goes back to the systemic issues. So we can't just approach this as, more programming, more services, more resources. We have to change the conditions for why people need these resources and services to begin with. And that is because of our systemic issues. So that's my plea. And I think we do have the opportunity to change the course in Boston. Uh, we have the opportunity. The question is, do we have the political will and courage to do it? Mm -hmm. Councillor Weir or Councillor Campbell, your thoughts on, are you optimistic about a reset? I'll jump in if, if um, Councillor Campbell wants, um, I'll jump in. Um, I think we've learned a lot of lessons from COVID or at least as Councillor Council President Janey was saying, there's more now in the um, mainstream news in terms of issues that communities and advocates and our black brothers and sisters have been bringing up for decades and, and generations. Um, but the lesson that I draw from the COVID crisis is that we can do anything we need to do. Right? We have all of the resources we need when we want to address a crisis, when we actually decide that we're gonna do something about it. You know, so many of the things that are happening now, although I agree with Councilor Edwards that um, they're just temporary, but still, even the steps that we've seen happen during COVID are steps that people have been asking for, community have been asking for for a long time and have been told time and again, too expensive, too hard, impossible, right? Can we make sure that every single Boston Public School student has access to a laptop and internet. Oh, you know, that was too expensive until we figured out that um, the gaps are so huge and we can't do remote learning without that. Can we try to provide free food for any family in Boston that needs it? Oh, no, no, you know, too hard um, until we realize that this is something that helps everyone, that we all depend on each other being able to be stable and have access to um, food and shelter and, and opportunity. Um, the T, right, in this moment, buses are currently free. Uh, the T is not collecting fares because they realize that, you know, amidst the crisis, folks are, that the T is a barrier, a cost barrier, and it's also safer for the drivers, speeds up the routes, if people are boarding um, in the back, keeping the drivers, um, protected and also not having everyone tap on the same surfaces with their cards or, or paying with coins and all of that. So I think there are a lot of things that we have seen happen that we want to see continue. Um, but um, I, I agree wholeheartedly that it comes down to making the decision of choosing to address a crisis. And there are many crises that are slower, um, not as immediate as a virus kind of descending upon everyone, but that are much more impactful to how future generations um, will have the chance to live and breathe and, and succeed in our city. Thank you, Councillor Campbell. Uh, thank you, Beth, for the question. And 
Am I optimistic? I, I, I'm always optimistic because I'm a believer. Um, I pray all the time. That's my foundation in my life. Um, I don't I often tell my colleagues, leave it at the front steps of City Hall when I walk in. Um, so am I optimistic? Yes. I look at my life story and by the grace, or but for the grace of God, I'm here. Um, my constituents in the district I serve, which is predominantly district of color, and the incredible work that my constituents have been doing for decades to dismantle systems, create new systems, uh, to eliminate inequities, they keep me optimistic and hopeful. Um, the question is, and I think more appropriate for many is, you know, are we going to now be intentional where we need to be with respect to communities of color? And there are various ways we can do that. Um, you know, I am looking at COVID-19 in particular, my district is being hit extremely hard. Um, you know, I, my biggest neighborhoods are Dorchester and Mattapan. Um, the health inequities, we already knew inequities existed long before COVID-19. Of course, they're being exacerbated by uh, COVID-19. Um, but the question is, you know, these communities were less resilient a long time ago. You know, there were maps, there were studies. Um, we had a chief resiliency officer in the city of Boston who was phenomenal, whose position was created to help neighborhoods like Mattapan. Mattapan and Dorchester and Roxbury become more resilient in the face of natural disasters and pandemics and crises. She, along with many others, could see what was to come. Um, we have seen, and across this country, um, other uh, situations, whether they're natural or unnatural, where we said communities of color were hit hard. What are we going to do differently to make them more resilient? We had an opportunity to do just that. We did not resource that office. We did not give it the appropriate resources it needed to be impactful. Um, we did not uh, attach ourselves to, to that office to say, how are we going to make sure that she and her team have everything they need so that when crisis like this hit the city of Boston, communities of color, certain neighborhoods do not have to disproportionately feel the brunt of those crises. Um, we got that wrong. So yes, now we have an opportunity to get it right. Um, and one way of doing that is to make sure right here in the city of Boston, our office of uh, resiliency is invested in, um, that that office has the human capital and resources it needs. Um, in addition to that, I know there was a question in the chat from a dear friend of mine around racial equity trainings and having these type of conversations. It may seem simple and it's like, let's attach 10 other things. It's actually quite hard to have a robust racial equity training. I know the Fed did their two-day training. Um, some folks showed up. I went to that racial training. It was hard. There were a lot of folks, mainly white folks, who showed up at the first day but did not come back. So it's a great place to start in all of our institutions. Um, if you have an office that does work in the resiliency space, invest in them, give them human capital, give them money, take their work seriously. Other ways that we can be intentional is to look at the city of Boston and say, where do we need to go deep? Someone asked me the question once, if I had the power, um, you know, looking at my lens through District 4, if I had more expansive power, what would I do with it? I would be intentional around certain neighborhoods in the city of Boston that have been under-resourced and under-invested in for far too long. Start there. You get those problems right, which are really hard to tackle. We're talking about a lot of systems higher ed, education, public safety, policing, criminal justice, banking, all these systems we have to get right. That's hard work. Start with those neighborhoods in Boston that need us to go there first. We get that right. Everything else, frankly, I think is a little bit easy. Um, and so I like the hard stuff. I look forward to working in partnership with anyone who's willing to take on uh, the tough conversations. And you know, so I'm optimistic all the time but we have to be more intentional. And I hope this, uh, what is happening in this city, in this country right now, and internationally, is a new, um, creates a new sense of urgency for other people who just weren't getting it. Thank you for that. I'm going to look at the questions and open it up. And if, I, I don't think any are necessarily geared at a particular counselor. So if you want to raise your little hand icon, I can call on you to answer it. 
Um, the first question I see is, um, I am a PBS teacher and I wonder how can we hold schools and educators accountable to not only do the personal work that is required to understand racism in its many forms, especially interpersonal and structural, but that schools will actually teach the hard topics of race and equity. Council Mejia. Yeah, so uh, thank you for that question. Two things, one is I can stay a little bit longer so I don't have to rush off to my other Zoom. So I'll be here for the duration of the program. Um, and two, I, I think talking about race um, is always hard. Um, especially in Boston, for those who don't know, Boston has a long history of uh, racial tension, specifically around the busing era and the mid 70s and all the chaos that went on then. And I still think that in the city of Boston, we have yet to um, recover from that trauma. And I, and I think that in terms of really being real, uh, I, I think one of the things that we can do um, is really first look at the curriculum. What are we teaching our young people? We have been leading young people to believe that Columbus was the one who uh, discovered America, but in reality, our people were already here. <laughs> and, and so I, I think that some of it is just really reevaluating the curriculum and are we teaching, um, are we teaching our, our, our students things that are affirming to, to, to their culture and, and, and to the truth? Um, the, other, the other piece that I think um, is we always lead from a place of deficit. Every time we talk about communities of color, we always talk about all the things that we don't have, but we don't lead with all the things that we do have. And I think as educators, we also have an opportunity to really uplift you know, the, the fact that young people carry trauma in their backpacks and on the way to school, they're, do they're dodging bullets and being exp exposed to so many things that are happening, but yet we want them to sit in the classroom and leave all of that at the door. Where if we're really serious about talking about issues of race, we have to also talk about the environment in which our young people are living in, right? So I think, I think this work, in in terms of just racism, it's not just talking about it. I think it's about redesigning the entire way we interact with students. Um, I think we have an opportunity to also push back on the Department of Education. Um, you will we asking teachers every day to do more with less, but we're not creating a space for them to really have meaningful um, uh, interactions with students that allow for getting to know you. Uh, I, I think that's one of the things that we, we can explore. And, um, you know, I think for me, one of the things that I always struggle with and I talk about often is that um, as women of color, well, as a woman of color, I, I struggle with what they call the imposter syndrome, right? And there's this whole notion that I'm supposed to leave myself at the door so that other people can feel comfortable. But we have to get to a point that when we're talking about issues of race and equity, and lack thereof, that we can be uncomfortable with the fact that there's some people who are okay with just not dealing with it. And I think educators need to be able to have a space to really get real about their own implicit biases um, that they carry into the schools. And it's gonna require training, it's gonna require a lot of heart, but I think as we talk about elected officials having political will, um, we need for our educators to have the emotional vulnerability to be able to have that conversation and be uncomfortable while having it. Great. And I'm going to go to Councilor President Janey and then Councilor Sabi George looking at the hands that were up. Thank you so much. And just to build on that, I think uh, Julia made excellent points. Already, the school committee adopted a policy uh, I think it was 2016, the Opportunity and Achievement Gap Policy. In that policy, it calls for a decolonized curriculum to address many of the things that uh, Julia was mentioning. We need to do that. We need to make sure that we have teachers that reflect the rich diversity of our student body. Once again, the policy says that as well. Um, so we, part of the challenge is 
when we have these good policies on the books, but then we don't do it. So part, we need to create more policies and make sure they get implemented, but we already have some good ones that aren't being implemented. In addition, we have to look at AWC, who has access, who doesn't, you know, excellence for all. All of these many programs are exam schools. That comes up a lot in the council. There are, there are those who really are pushing for a new way of looking at uh, Boston Latin School, Boston Latin Academy, and O'Brien. Some question, do we need exam schools? Um, others defend them, but not everyone has access. And, and people will throw up, well, it's a meritocracy. And we need to you know, protect that because if you work hard, you, know, you should be rewarded and you should be able to aspire uh, to whatever your heart's desire. And that's certainly the American dream. But the problem is everyone hasn't been afforded the same opportunity. So you can't have a meritocracy if everyone, like if some people have been excluded from the opportunity to um, excel because they were denied the test prep because they grew up in a poor community and their families weren't able to purchase homes and generate some generational wealth. There, there are lots of uh, built-in inequities in our system that play out in our schools every day. That's what we see. That's exactly what we see in our schools. And so we have to do things differently. I would love to see every child, every student who graduates from Boston Public Schools bilingual and in minimum of two languages. We do our children, we do our students a disservice by having them think that, and you know, we're doing much better in Boston. You know, there was a time where it was like English only and that was the way to go. And unfortunately, many immigrant families felt the same way, that that was the way to, to be successful in this country, that you had to lose a part of yourself. That is, that, this is part of the pain that we carry, that we have to deny ourselves. We have to somehow suppress uh, you know, in this country. And so our children feel that too. There was a study maybe 10 years ago at the Gaston Institute at UMass, Meren Oriate did it. And that study found that the more that Latino children stayed in Boston public schools, the worse they felt about themselves. That's heartbreaking. Now that was an old study. So I'm hopeful that Many of the initiatives that we've been putting in place are making a difference, but it's not enough. We've got policies we need to implement and we've got other policies we need to create. Thank you. Councillor Sabi George and then Councillor Edwards. Uh, thank you, Beth. And you know, I just, I want to agree with what both Kim and Julia said about the work that needs to happen to change, whether it's the curriculum to make sure that we have teachers that reflect the diversity of our kids in place. But as someone who spent 13 years in the classroom, if our kids aren't coming to the classroom ready to learn, if they don't have the mental health supports that they need in place, if they're bringing that trauma that Julia referenced um, in her comments, if they're bringing that to the classroom, we can, we can have the, the greatest curriculum ready for them to access and they're not gonna be able to tap into it. We need to make sure that our kids, and we talk a lot about separating kids um, from their classroom, from their teachers, from some of their support networks during this time while they're doing school from home. And on the long list of things that they're missing out on, academics is last. And you know, our kids are missing their times with their uh, emotional and social support network when we think about their, their peers. They're missing the time with counselors, uh, whether it's a mental health counselor or a school counselor who is delivering services to them. And for me, that's a, a real uh, missing piece when we think about supporting our kids and supporting them to be successful. And, and it's, it's without those supports that our kids won't be able to find it. And it's been a big part of my work on the council, making sure that we have a full-time nurse in all of our school buildings because a year and a half, two years ago, we did not. We worked to make sure that every, every school had a full-time nurse. We're doing the same around social and emotional supports. We need mental health uh, specialists and social workers in our schools to make sure that our kids are getting those additional supports so that when they're in the classroom, they can, they can connect with that curriculum. And that curriculum, obviously, it has to be connectable 
but they're not even there yet. We need to make sure that those support systems are in place for our kids. Um, it has to be, education has to be a holistic approach and thinking about uh, what that baggage is that our kids are bringing into those classrooms that's preventing them from engaging with that curriculum to begin with. So it's, it's all of these prongs in this system that are broken. Um, and for me, those social and emotional supports are critical for our kids. Council Edwards. I, I um, you know, I think it's, again, back to the reset. Uh, so we're at this moment, we have a billion dollar budget. Nothing that we have said so far is new about the needs that we need to have or why, they, why we need to have them. And yet, I, I can tell you looking, and I'm sure if all of us look at our budget right now, our school budget doesn't reflect that we are meeting all of those needs. We're trying, but we're not. And, and that I think is what I feel a lot of people are frustrated by this moment in this, in this time. If the budget doesn't get not just one nurse, but a nurse and a social worker right now in every single school. If the budget doesn't have that, didn't have it before pre-COVID, and doesn't have that now, then, then we're not learning. Then we're not changing. Does the budget right now, that's my question, I'll check, have a social worker and a nurse in every single Boston public school? If it doesn't, then the reset isn't happening. And I think that's the point of what Councilor Wu said. We found the money for things we didn't know we were gonna have to fund by just basically doing the public-private partnerships and putting ourselves out there and getting a resiliency fund and getting that money to get food to kids, to get computers to kids, to do it. We exercise political will to get the money there. So the question is for stuff that has already been demonstrated been uh, systemic issues that we have seen for years and haven't funded. Why can't we find the money for them? Why doesn't the budget reflect that now? Why isn't the reset happening in the budget? And that I think is what I, a lot of people feel frustrated. So everything we just said that we need, that we need to have, if our budget doesn't reflect that it's going to do that in BPS, then are we, are we kidding ourselves by saying we're, we're not also taking this opportunity to reset? Right. Thank you. Because uh, Councillor Braden, your hands up. Your frustration. You're on, you're on mute, Councillor. I'm always on mute. <laughs> Sorry about that. I, I share uh, the frustration of my colleagues and, and also the, the issue around exam schools it's it's probably it's it's just, we have one we have these great exam schools that are rated top rated schools in the country but we but the re, the imbalance in resources and the uh the emphasis on on the success in our exam schools leaves the other uh comprehensive high schools uh behind and I really feel that uh, we we need to really rebalance the the uh, emphasis on on really f developing uh, our comprehensive high schools uh, so that every high school student has the opportunity to achieve their full potential um, so the selection process for the exam exam schools is 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 problematic um, and um, the preparation to do the exam uh, biases towards those families that maybe have more resources to put into uh, preparing their stu the student for the exam test. And, and, and that whole process just ex exaggerates and, inf and uh, uh, inflates the whole um, imbalance in, in our system. Um, so it's really something that's going to be an ongoing concern of mine uh, to make sure that uh, if, you, if, you, if a student is not uh, selected to go to an exam school, that that should not be the end of their opportunity uh, pathway, that they should have every other opportunity that they could avail of going forward. Thank you. I'm going to try to get in one last question since we're running up on time. And I do want to 
also share one of the, the initial question talked about how we could teach things differently. Um, and I do think we need to also talk about how we have to provide training to teachers to be able to have these conversations, right? If you haven't done your own work, if you haven't reflected on what race means to you, how it's showing up, um, in society, how can you talk to young people about that if you're not comfortable? So there really has to also be support for teachers to be able to engage in these conversations um, so they don't do harm to our students. Um, question that has gotten a lot of thumbs up, can you tell us about how federal, state, and local funding comes together to determine the priorities of the Boston Police Department? I'm gonna I'm I'm gonna defer to the chair of Ways and Means or the chair of Public Safety on that one. Can you repeat the question? I didn't hear it, Beth. Sure. Can you tell us about how federal, state, local, and um, yes, federal, state, and local funding comes together to determine the priorities of the Boston Police Department? So I'm I'm happy to to take this on. Um, as, as chair of the Committee on Public Safety and Criminal Justice, um, we have had several hearings on, on funding uh, that comes not only from, hold on, make sure you give my son Aiden, who says hello and goodbye. <laughs> 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 to my husband, who's, thank God for, uh, for husbands. Um, but um, I, so the way it's set up, so uh, the city of Boston obviously receives a lot of funding, both from the federal government, the state, um, and of course within our own budget for law enforcement and public safety agencies to do various things. Um, specifically with the police department, um, there are grants that come in all the time. Some are new, some are old. There's a review process um, that, that the council goes through. So we have a hearing tomorrow. I think I'm now sitting on about 2000 emails with respect to that hearing tomorrow. Um, and uh, requests from folks in the community to think about that funding and where it goes, which is great. This is another way for us to be advocating in these moments, um, is to showing up at, at our hearings to figure out where the money's going. Um, and it's a legitimate question. Um, I held a hearing on the council in partnership with many of my colleagues um, on the council to ask some questions around funding, for example, for violence. So violence prevention, violence intervention, reentry programming for folks who were recently incarcerated. Um, and we had questions around, you know, how much money do we get? What's the total amount of money within uh, the city that we get from the feds, the state, and in our own budget for these purposes? How is that money being used? What metrics do we use to determine whether or not we're being successful? How do we hold ourselves accountable? What's the process to give that money out to the community? All these questions, and let me tell you, some of those questions were answered, some were not. And so this is an opportunity for folks in the community space to show up, to ask some of the tough questions around how much money are we getting? Where is it going? Um, and we play a role in that based on our constituencies, but I think there's an opportunity for more people to show up to ask uh, where that money is going. And I'll, I'll add one thing, in my first year on the council, as chair of public safety, my very first hearing was on uh, two sets of grants from the state for violence prevention. And I was aware of those grants because when I worked for Governor Patrick, that was in my purview as a lawyer for him. And he helped create the grants and they're all designed for violence prevention and intervention. One of the grants was in the millions. Um, and I think it was about $1.6 million. And it was shocking to me that we had been receiving that grant for years, but the same 10 organizations, for example, had received the grant. And I said, well, what's the review process we go through to see if they're actually stopping violence in our community? Um, there was no process. How do we hold them accountable? If you're an organization doing great work, how do you apply for more money? Then I asked even deeper questions. How many young people are we touching with this money to stop violence? And if you tell me it's 1.6 million and only 60 young people, well, I have a problem with that. So there's a lot more questions we could be asking and pushing for to do a better job when it comes to our resources and our funding. Um, I wanna turn over my time, obviously some of my time to Councilor Bach as chair of Ways and Means, but this is a critical issue, not just for the police department, for every department as well. 
Right. Councilor Block, I'm gonna give you the last word since we're past 5.30. Okay, sure. I, I wanted to let Councilor Campbell um, speak to this, but yeah, in terms of the budget, I think it's important for people to know the police budget is largely a local budget. It's uh, $414 million in our, of out of our general fund money, which is actually 15% of the money that we allocate out of the general fund this year. Um, it's overall about 11.5% of our city budget because, um, because of the sort of other funds. Um, so it's a lower percentage of the city budget, but it's still quite a high percent. Um, and I think there's a, a couple of things I would quickly want to say to people on this are um, when you look at the money that we spend on police in this municipality and in others, it's also got the conversation about changing that has to be a conversation both about municipal budgets and about collective bargaining. Um, because a bunch of the things, a bunch of the conditions of sort of how our police forces operate are subject to the collective bargaining um, that the city goes through every three years. And, you know, collective bargaining agreements that the city council approves. So I think I wanna push, I wanna point people to the fact that the, the budget is one piece, but the CBAs are another piece. Um, and I think, I think the reason, I mean, there's a bunch of reasons it's really good that people are raising their voices on this right now. Um, one is about the policies that, you know, that we see leading to police brutality and the need to, the need to change those and the fact that um, there are resources behind the implementation of some of those policies. The other piece is that historically part of how um, police budgets have grown as a proportion of city budgets is that when you go through a recessionary period, people cut what's considered more discretionary spending, right? The nice to haves and, and don't reduce public safety, right? And that's how the percentage of your, um, the percentage of your city budget that goes to that creeps ever upwards. Um, and I think the reality is we all know that we're in a really difficult economic time right now. Uh, and, and the question before us, both in this budget cycle and probably even more acutely in next year's budget cycle is, you know, how do we, how do we make those choices about how we're going to rebuild equitably, how we're going to rebuild in like a better, a better local society. Um, and we can't just be on autopilot on those fronts. So there is that we've been talking a lot. There, a lot of my colleagues have talked about the things that we need to see added. Um, there's also a question of, of what we need to leave behind. Thank you. And I want to thank all of the council women for, for being with us uh, this afternoon. This was really, I think, a, a fruitful discussion on so many levels. And I really appreciate your, your, appreciate your honesty, your, your vulnerability, um, your hopes, your dreams, your frustrations, and, and sharing that with, with everyone. I also hope and I also encourage people that were listening on this call to really think about how do you continue this conversation and how do you turn this into action, right? Conversations are great, they're wonderful, but it's action that needs to happen. So what can you take away? Even showing up at a council meeting and advocating for what you believe, right? Let's show up and help these women make the change that they're trying to make so we can really have a different city of Boston than what we have certainly seen today thus far. Um, again, thank you. And I think we will share some of the questions we didn't get to with the counselors and their team. And if they have an opportunity to tweet out responses, they will. I appreciate uh, your indulgence in going over, but this was just such a wonderful conversation. It was hard to stop. So thank you again, counselors. Thank you. Thank you, Beth. The thank you Beth. so much thank for the participants. Thank you for your partnership and your leadership. Thank you. Thank you.